Good morning, everyone. Can you believe it that we're in the last month of the year? This month, this year has just passed. It's just gone so fast. And we're here getting ready to enter into 2024. And I'm so glad that you're ending strong. And what you're saying is, I want to enter into 2024 with momentum. And that's a choice. And you've made that choice. I'm glad anybody that's online, those online, those that are here in our in our LA campus, in our Uganda campuses, in our Kenya campuses, in our Arrowhead campus, in our Oregon campus, Arizona campus, our Mexico campus, and and so many other ones that that God has blessed us with. And and we're all tuning in on Sunday morning and we're saying, God, we want to hear from you today. And I love this song that says that he's undefeated. Now, you really got to proclaim that over your life, that he's undefeated. And this is important. You're not undefeated. He's undefeated. We've we've been defeated. There's been a there's been a lot of losses we've experienced, a lot of letdowns. We we failed. But no matter how down you feel today, this is what you need. You need to tag Jesus into your battle tag Jesus into your life and this is what happens when Jesus comes in to your life I, I, another way to say it, he comes into your boat we're all traveling and one of the stories that's really cool in the Bible is that Jesus tells his followers his disciples he says get in the boat and let's cross to the other side of the lake and that's called a transition or it's a journey uh, but what this is cool. Jesus gets in a boat with them. Uh, but he doesn't tell them that they're going to run into some storms. Uh, just because you're a believer doesn't mean you won't run into storms. But the difference between you and everybody else that's in the same storm is that Jesus is in the boat with you. And you know what that means? That means that that boat, maybe there's other boats that can sink. There's other boats that could be overcome by the wind and the waves but not your boat. And not because you're powerful, it's because the one that's in your boat is undefeatable, he's unconquerable, and he walks on water. If you're in this room and you feel like, man, I feel like I'm going through the storm of your life. I, I used to, you know, watch a little of WWF, and I, I love the entertainment value of it. And it was so exciting when you would see the tag team matches. I used to like those. Uh, they would tag team, and then this is always that happened. This was the story. One of them would be getting the tar beat out of them, out of them. and he'd be like, they're throwing them around, and then he gets finally to near the edge of the ring, and he ah, he's reaching out, and we know that the guy he's ready to tag in is the champion. And, and, and it seems like he just can't reach him. He's inches away, and then finally he tags him, and there's a momentum shift. And, and I really believe that some of you right now are stretching out and you're here today and God said, just tag me. Come on, just let me in your life and there will be a, a momentum shift. It's, come on, is anybody ready to take those losses and let Jesus turn them into wins? That's who he is. So I'm glad you're here today. And, and what we've done today already is we've sang some songs and we worship God in our giving. And we're going to do one more offering we do like three special offerings a year. One is at the end of the year during Christmas. And then we end strong. And then we do a, an offering to begin the year to put God first. And then we do one in our, in our anniversary time that we're celebrating. And next year we'll be celebrating 20 years of ministry. And what we're saying, God, we want to celebrate what you've done and we want you to expand. So we do that three times a year. And this is one of those days. If you're here for the first time, we're going to be talking about giving. And giving is not a bad word. It's actually good. And we teach our little kids that they should share. How many believe giving is a good thing? And, and during Christmas, uh, to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, there's a whole bunch of giving. A matter of fact, there's not a time in the year that there's more given than right now. And what it's supposed to do is represent the heart of God. It's also supposed to represent love. That when someone's giving you a gift, they're saying, I thought about you. I love you. You're important to me. But we need to be careful that we don't celebrate the commercial Christmas and we forget about the spiritual Christmas. 
You know, I, they, 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 I look at some stats. This year, we're going to spend in America over $1 trillion on gifts. Crazy. The average family will spend over $1,500 on gifts. I, 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 I saw this stat. 46% of people lie and tell you that they like the gifts you give them and they really don't. This year, this year, over 30 million Christmas trees will be sold. Not, not fake ones, real ones. I don't even understand how we even have a forest after that. But we need to be careful that we're buying trees, we're buying gifts for each other. And they said 51% of people that go out and get gifts end up giving, getting themselves a gift. And it's okay to get yourself a gift, but let's not forget it's not your birthday we're celebrating, it's his birthday. And what we're saying as a church that we're making sure that as we start off the month of December and this Christmas season, that we're first giving Jesus our best gift and we're going to give an offering to him. How many understand you can't give an offering without giving your heart? Uh, this is what I learned about giving. Um, it's easy to give your life to Jesus when you're struggling, you're hurting. You come to Jesus with nothing, with pain, with hurt, with destruction, ruined relationships, emptiness. And it's easy to give your life to Jesus at that moment. But the last thing usually people give after they give their life to Jesus is their finances. And, and the reason is your number one competitor to God is your faith in money. It's your treasure. But this is what God, see, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. But he knows this. He can never have your heart totally until you give your treasure. And when you give your treasure, you're giving your what? heart and the people we love most we give to how many understand that it's hard sometimes to give somebody something that you don't care for but for someone you love you'll give your best to them and this is going to be an opportunity for us to talk about giving our best to the Lord so we're going to pray we're going to read a few scriptures and this portion of scripture we're going to read today is all about an offering um and that's what it's all about of someone that gave an extravagant offering to the Lord and what was Jesus' response to that offering. And Jesus saw it, Jesus acknowledged it. And at the end he says, when she gave her offering, she said this, she's done something really beautiful to me. And understand you cannot give an offering without giving it to Jesus. It's beautiful to him. It's good to him. It's attractive to him. How many understand that? Like, whoa, they're giving me their, what? right? It means something to him, and I hope, hopefully it means something to us. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Teach us today your word, and help us to understand it, and help us not to ever get offended by it. Help us to learn it, apply it, and see the fruits of applying that word, because you're always given a scripture to lead us to the ultimate blessed life. Father, we need to be taught, then we apply, and then we see the results. Change our hearts today to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So let's, let's go ahead and look at a portion of Scripture. Um, this is a real story that happened over 2,000 years ago. And it was a real moment. And this was a week. Someone say a week or six days before Jesus is actually arrested crucified and buried. Six days after this, Jesus would be on a cross and he would be in a tomb. They did not realize that they only had six days to spend with Jesus. After he died for their sins, went to that cross and was buried, uh, the idea of them having this kind of access to him would never be available in this way ever again. There was a six-day countdown. We, we also need to be aware of the time that we're living in right now. You'll never have another Christmas like this one. This is a time that we could worship God. This is a time that we could come to church 
and celebrating. This is the time that we could bring people to Jesus so they could get saved. There's a lot of people that will come to Jesus next week and the week after if you just invite them to church. Don't miss this opportunity because tomorrow is not guaranteed. So let's look at this scripture in Matthew 26, 6, and it's about a woman that was in tune with what was happening. Uh, this, this story begins at someone's house, and let's read this. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head and he, as, as he was reclining at the table. I'm just going to read the whole story. When the disciples, the disciples, when the disciples saw this offering and they saw her given this perfume and they saw the value of the perfume, this is what they said. They were indignant. Why this way? So their attitude was, I'm angry. I'm upset that they're, she's given this type of offering to the Lord. So there's an attitude there. We'll discuss it in a little bit. Um, and they asked, why this waste? They asked. Now, I don't know if they're were, they were probably talking to each other. What a waste. You see what she's doing? That she's given this very expensive perfume and she's given it to Jesus and she's given this gift. What a waste. I'm upset. Have you ever got offended at an offering? Have you ever got offended when God is asking you not just to give your heart, but to give your finances? Have you ever had a bad attitude about that? And it's so crazy that we don't have a bad attitude when, when Best Buy asks for your money for that big screen TV. You don't have a bad attitude when, when Verizon gets that, you know, they, they even put you on, they put you on prepaid stuff. They want to make sure they're getting theirs. And Netflix, they, they don't just give you Netflix. They want a subscription. Like, we want to tie it to your account. Because I don't care. It's an exchange. I get some entertainment. But don't you understand that when you're giving your life to Jesus, there was an exchange, and your exchange was forgiveness. Your exchange was new life. Your exchange was freedom. Your exchange, come on, your exchange was a new beginning. Your exchange that you gave your life, and he gave you his spirit, and he helped you overcome. The exchange that he gave you, you gave nothing. He gave you everything. And then we have a problem with giving back to him. As an act of worship, let's look at this. Well, anyways, they had a problem with, and we're talking about his inner circle disciples had a problem with an offering. So, uh, so they ask, what a, why, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. So now they're saying, you know, the reason we're upset is because this is not the best use of this money. We're feeling there's a better use. But understand this. They weren't saying they wanted to give to the poor. They were just using that as an excuse to justify them being angry at her. They didn't care about the poor. They cared about the money. Right? So when we get offended about an offering, it's like that you're not, you're not getting offended because someone's asking you to give. You're getting offended that they're trying to get your money. And uh, well, understand this, when you leave this earth, you're not going to take your money with you. And I'll tell you why, because it's not your money. By the time you're done, you're going to leave everything behind. And the only thing that matters is how you invested your time and how you invested your money. And I pray when it's all said and done that you invested your money in kingdom vision and kingdom assignments by the time you're done with this earth that there was an investment and the investment you made led to treasure in heaven you know what that means souls being saved imagine you giving your life to Jesus and you get to heaven and there's not one person there impacted by your breath and your life and your finances because you never invested in souls so you never got a return just think about that now, I'm telling you, everybody wants your money, and, and they're, like, really going after, right? It, credit cards want your money. It's crazy. Now, if you, if you get a credit card right now, you go into debt, and, and you put something on credit card, and you don't pay it off in a month, you're probably looking at 30% interest. That's, that, you know what that is? Criminal. That's loan sharking. You're literally telling me you're going to charge me 30% for, and, and all, all, I, all I bought was a little radio? Yeah, we are. And they're unapologetic. Come on, get your credit. You could buy anything, 0% for six months. And after that, 
we're going to get you. We should get offended about that, but we should never get offended that we're giving an offer to the Lord. Because anything you do for the Lord is never a waste. And I would also say anything that you're spending your money that's not the Lord, eventually it will be a waste. Because it will never make an eternal impact. And I'm not saying eating is a waste. I'm not saying paying your rents a waste. All I'm saying is there's certain things that will feed you in this life, but there's certain things that will follow you for eternity. So make sure that you're making some eternal investments and you're not just storing up your treasure here on earth, but you're storing up your treasure in heaven and our greatest treasure in a soul being saved. So let's look at this. So they're talking, they're having a discussion. Someone say discussion. During every offering, there's a discussion. There's an internal discussion that's happening within you. And verse 10, um, aware of this. Is Jesus aware of what we're thinking? And is he aware of what the disciples were thinking? Is he aware of this lady that gave an offering? Yes, she's, he's aware. Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always be with you, but you will not always have me. Well, of course, six days he would die and, and, and then he would be buried. In verse 12, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Now, um, it would be a dishonor in these days to be buried without the body being prepared. Now, we knew this, that when Jesus died and on that cross, there was no preparation for his body. He was just thrown into the tomb, but God already knew, no, I'm going to prepare his body by this offering, and we're going to make sure that he dies, but when he dies, he dies honorably, that he would be prepared his body through this ointment, this perfume that was given six days before. That's just bonus stuff. When she, so truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached, wherever the good news of Jesus Christ is preached throughout the world, so every time someone hears about Jesus throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now, I want you to get this. What she did didn't just make a temporary impact on her life. What she did made an eternal impact on her name. This offering would never be forgotten. 2,000 years, we're preaching about Jesus, and she's smack dab in the middle of the story. She's in the week the most important week of the history of the world, right before Jesus goes, suffers and dies for the sin of mankind and is buried and resurrects. There's an offering from a lady. And Jesus is saying, this will never be forgotten. Every time they're preaching the gospel, they have to mention her. Wow. The one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, he was there among the disciples He's one of the 12 that's in this offering moment. Remember, the disciples are upset. They're indignant. They're saying it's a waste of time. We're annoyed. We're offended by this offering. And he was one of them. And this is his response after this, this beautiful thing that Jesus called. It's a beautiful thing she did to me. Then one of the 12 disciples called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest. This was crazy. Right after this offering, Judas was so offended that he betrayed Jesus. Then one of the 12, he went to the priest and asked, what will you, what are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus or him to you? Now that's a backstabber. Like he was so mad about this offering, he goes, I'm done with this. We're going to now, it's all about the money. And I'm going to go to those chief priests and say, what will you give me if I give you Jesus? And they said, 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. And Jesus sold, uh, Judas sold his soul, sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And after he did it, he committed suicide. Based on an attitude towards an offering and money. It's possible for us to sell our soul to money and love money so much that we can't give our lives to Jesus. But isn't it, isn't it true that whatever you serve demands your money? 
right? If you have a drug addiction, you can't go over there without some money to get an excuse. Come on, give me my drugs. Go get some money. You can't get the drugs without the money. So you better go out there steal. You better go out there do your thing. You better go out there and hustle. But if you want what I have, give me your money. And see, when the enemy knows this, when he gets your money, he gets your worship. Because what you worship, you give money to. I, you know, I went, I was walking through the casino the other day. So what were you doing there? I stayed the night because I was, I was in a place. I don't tell your whole story. I wasn't gambling, but I was there. Right? <laughs> And I, now if you see me there, this is what I'm doing. I'm either spending night in a hotel or I'm getting food there because they have some good deals. And, and, and some, like oh, the one, I don't know what is Morango, I don't know what they, the one over here, they got a burger place in there that when I go to Las Vegas, I just stop in and get me a good burger. And I go, with, with, they have root beer floats with it. And I go, ah, Lisa, let's go in there. So I'm just walking through. Maybe you saw me there gambling, but I was walking just getting my hamburger. But, but this is what I told Lisa. I go, out of all the times I've walked through a casino, I've not saw anybody win yet. I've not somebody, seen somebody like, ah, i never seen it. So I go, everybody's losing here. The majority of people are losing, and they're building the most beautiful buildings, but no one's mad that they're losing everything for a chance. But when it comes to worshiping the Lord with our lives and worshiping with the Lord with our finances, how come all of a sudden we're getting all mad? Because the devil already knows that when you give an offering, you're also giving your heart. And the last thing he wants is for you to totally surrender to the Lord. Because once you totally surrender to the Lord, there's going to be no limits of what God can do in your life. And this is what he's saying. Not only did I save you, but you're going to make a maximum impact. How many understand that your seeds that you're planting is going to turn into lives being transformed? And I want to thank you for every offering that you've given because we've reached thousands of people for the glory of God. And this is what's happened. People are going to heaven. People are getting set free. People, come on, come on. I just spent some time helping a young lady get delivered from demons in last service. Come on. People that are out there on the streets now have a home. They're being discipled. We're reaching Africa. We got a missionary team. We got a men's home. We got a women's home. We got a place that, we got a warehouse where we give food. And all of it is because we're saying, God, you did it for me. Continue doing it through me. God, I love you. So this is what Judas did. What are you willing to give me to deliver Jesus to you? That's crazy. You might be thinking, I would never do that. Are you sure? Because the enemy's saying, is it, it, the enemy's saying this, are you sure that you'd be willing to give what I asked you to give? Or are you going to say, I won't give it because I love my money so much. I'll give up Jesus for the money. The Bible says that, that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and, and, and this, lovers of pleasure, but they won't love God. And that's going to be the last day spirit. We got to be super careful that we don't get caught up in that. So they say, so they counted out for him. Just imagine this exchange. Instead of him giving an offering, he's receiving an offering of 30 pieces of silver, and he's betraying Jesus. This lady would be, have a memorial for her offering that should be honored and praised forever for eternity, and Judas would have a memorial of, of him, his betrayal that would be in Scripture forever. Now, Imagine how crazy this would be that you were with Jesus for three years and end up going to hell. The Savior, the Deliverer, what got him to that point was a love of money. So now, why should we give our best gift to him? Let's just go through some quick reasons. Number one, because we are grateful for what he's done for us. Anybody grateful for what he's done for you? That's why you should, we should give our best. The Bible, the scripture opens up that this, this, this offering was at a man, his name was Simon the leper, and he, it was at his house, 
And no one knew that it was six days left, but Jesus knew. Uh, so they have this dinner, and this lady starts thinking, Jesus is going to be in my town, and I, I'm going to meet up with him, and I'm going to that house for dinner, but I don't want to show up empty-handed. I want to show up with an offering that represents my heart, and I want him to know that I love him, and, and I also want him to know that I treasure him, and I also want him to know that I'm grateful, and I want, her to, I want him to know that I'm devoted to him, and I want him to know that I'm not going to withhold anything from him, and I'm not just going to give any old gift. I'm going to give the best gift that I have. And she started searching, what can I give the Lord? So now, so she's, they're in this home, but they're in the home of Simon the leper. Now, this is interesting. Simon didn't have leprosy at this point in his life. This was a nickname that was attached to his past life. There are people right now that haven't let you get over what you used to be. And they still associate you with what you used to be. It was Simon the alcoholic, Marco the lustful, Marco the prideful, Marco the jealous, Marco the angry, Marco the violent. That was me. And there's some people still might call you by who you used to be. And they called Simon by who he used to be, but I, this is what it turned in. It turned into a testimony. That means they know you by your past, and they're saying, you used to be Marco the drug addict, used to be Marco the womanizer, but what happened to you? Because I don't see any remnant of that on your life anymore, any residue on that, your life anymore. What happened to you? Well, let me tell you my story. I was a leper. I was contagious. I was being destroyed. I, I was an outcast. Nobody loved me. Nobody cared about me. My hands were falling off. My fing limbs were falling off. I couldn't walk anymore. But there was a day that in my lowest moment when nobody else was there, Jesus met me in my lowest moment. And when nobody touched me, he touched me and he healed me. That's why I'm giving an offering. You must not forget where you came from. An offering reminds us. Say, God, I'm grateful for what you've done for me and my family. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for giving me purpose. Thank you for loving me. Thank you. Thank you for giving me value and worth. Simon did it. Simon could never forget. Because they would ask him, he would say, well, that's who I was. But I'm not that person anymore. Because if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Look at my body. It's all brand new. Come on. Look at my mind. It's brand new. I'm no longer what I used to be. So that's number one. So that's why we should give an offer. Number two, because we love him and want to express how valuable he is to us. So this lady is now at this point where she's ready to meet with Jesus. And she starts thinking, taking inventory. How can I show honor and gratitude and love? Now, on her, this lady's named Mary. And Mary was, was the brother of Lazarus. Lazarus, her brother, died, and he was in a tomb. And Jesus came while he was in a tomb, and Jesus not only saved her, Jesus not only delivered her, Jesus didn't just give her hope, but her, her, her brother was in a tomb done, and Jesus calls him forth out of the dead, and she can't... She cannot stop thinking about how she, where her brother was, where she was. And she's saying, God, how can I show you gratitude of what you've done in my family, what you've done in my life? Come on. Has Jesus done anything for you? Has he done anything for your family? Let's not forget, this is our time to worship God and say, God, I love you. What she did was, she looked and the most valuable thing she had, with they, the ladies back in those days, they would, they would have an alabaster bottle or jar, and usually they would hang around their neck. And it, it, it represented, for many of them, their life savings. It represented what was most valuable to them. And, and what they would do, 
maybe once in their life, they would break the bottle open, the cap. It was, it, it, they had to break the neck of the bottle, and they would pour out their life. And she said, the most important thing I have, and this was worth a year's worth of wages. It was probably everything she had. It was her savings. It was her retirement. It was her identity. It was her savings account. And she says, this is what I got. This is the most valuable thing I have. And she says, before she got there, I know what I'm giving. I'm going to pour this out over Jesus' head. To, see, back in those days, the only ones that would have oil poured on their head were kings and priests. And, and, and she was anointing him as the king of her life. And she said, Jesus, maybe no one else here on the whole earth have given you their whole heart, but there's somebody here that will not withhold their best from you. And I want to let everybody know, you're my king. You're my Lord. And let me anoint you as a king. Come on. Your offering has an anointing on it. And it has an anointing of a king. And I want you to get this. When, you ain't get, when you're used to anoint a king, you get the king's anointing on your life. How many are ready to go to the next level authority in your life? Next level power in your life. So she's so, so she said, I'm going to give this. The woman brought a very expensive and valuable gift to him, which represented her heart. That's all it did. Very expensive means high value, high, highly valuable and prized, very precious. It also means the best. She brought the best to the Lord. She gave her treasure. Now, I want you to just think about this. She gave her treasure because she treasured more, Jesus more than her treasure. I know it sounds like a riddle. She gave her treasure because she desired Jesus more than her treasure. There are some people that desire their treasure more than Jesus, so they can't give up their treasure. They can't give up their finances because their finances, they value more than Jesus. But she was saying, I value, I got treasure, but I love you because you're my real treasure. And I desire you more than any treasure I have on earth. And when you're willing to give it all to the Lord, come on. When you give your best to the Lord, you get a harvest of the best of the Lord in your life. So we see the third reason why. Second reason, we just want to show him how do we want to express our love for him and want to express how valuable he is to us and her offering express her heart. Number three, why do we give our best to the Lord? Because we don't want to be like Judas. And the reason I say that is there's a war every time there's an offering. I think sometimes as a preacher, I could talk about everything, but the hardest thing to talk about is finances. And I'll tell you why. Because people get offended when you talk about finances. And I want you to think about this. Jesus' inner circle, his own disciples, were influenced by a demonic mindset. What makes us think that we could be in church our whole lives and not be influenced by the same exact spirit? So in every offering, there's a spirit of the Holy Spirit moving. But there's also a spirit of Judas, which is spirit of the devil. Now, the question I have, how does these disciples get influenced to be angry and upset about her offering. I would have just said this, it's none of your business. Why are you getting involved in her mess? This is none of your business. She's giving it to me. So why are you all upset, bothering her? Tell her, why are you doing that? I think it's dumb. I, I think you're wasting your money. I think all they want is your money. Can't you see it? You're getting bamboozled. Because the enemy knows that there's a war for your heart. And he wants you to see, the enemy knows if you give, souls are going to be saved. If you give, you give your heart. If you give, this is what you're saying, God, there's nothing I value more than you. And he says, when you give it all up for me, I'll give you everything that I have. And I will not withhold one blessing from you. How many understand God's trying to get something to you? So now, how did they get to that point now? How they got to that point is through words and discussions. Someone say discussions. So the ringleader about this discussion, this negative talk about her offering, was Judas. And we see it in John chapter 12. He's the ringleader. And what happens, these disciples had their guard down, and they began to discuss with Judas. And Judas was saying, what a waste of offering. What do you think? 
Have you ever anybody talk to you about your church and they'll say, what do you think about Pastor Markle? Some people are asking, not because they want to hear you, man, I love my church and I love my pastor. They're saying it because they want you to get in agreement with something negative and say, what do you think about that way? What do you think? You got to be careful who you're agreeing with because you could be agreeing with the devil himself and he could actually influence your spirit. And by the time you're done with that conversation, you are no longer you. So now what happened, they had this conversation with Judas and they were no longer them. They weren't like Jesus. They were like Judas. They were actually affected by his spirit. I, I remember, i tell you a story. I remember casting out a demon out of a young lady in our church. And, and um, once in a while I'll ask how they enter. And it was cold-blooded, man. The girl, the demon in her said, I, I, go, I go, what's your name? He goes, Rebellion. Ah. Rebellion, okay. What's your name? And, 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 and there's, there was more than one. What, and I go, and the next demon says, who are you? Jezebel. I go, okay. Okay, we have Rebellion Jezebel. So and then I did in, in, an investigation. Because I, I just want to know, how'd you enter? Like, how did you even enter her? And then they mention a sister in the church by name. And I go, well, how did you enter? He goes, through a conversation that she agreed with. So there's some conversations that aren't just words. There's some conversations that have seeds of demons. So they were talking with Judas, full of the devil, and they started thinking like the devil. The only one that gets mad at an offering is the devil. And if you're getting offended about an offering, you're agreeing with the devil. See, you don't have a problem with an offering when you're in need. You don't have a problem with an offering when there's a men's home and a women's home open up for your kid that's strung out. But you have a problem with an offering when God's asking you to give it. And God is saying, come on, be careful. I'm trying to get a blessing to you. I'm trying to get your heart. And if you give me your whole heart, you'll have the life that you've always wanted. So now let's look at, look at Judas. Look, look at Judas. Now, this is how it happened. John 12. Now, this isn't this offer moment. She's given this, this per expensive perfume. She's poured in on Jesus. It's a year's worth of wages. And Judas is like, he's looking at it. He's like, oh, this is so dumb. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. She's stupid. That's a word. And then he started thinking, how much is that? Hey, how much is that perfume worth? was two nards, two nards. That's a whole year's worth of wages, and she's pouring it on Jesus. She's given that expense. What a waste. What? I mean, this is a misuse of finances. That's how he was talking about. Look what he says. The disciples, oh, no, wait, wait. Judas is scared. The disciple who would soon betray him said, so we already know betrayal was in his heart already. So you got to be careful. See, this is what I've learned. Before you backslide, you stop giving. Because something is already taken over your heart. Before you backslide, you start getting offended with the church. If you're offended with the church, you're offended with the body of Jesus Christ. And the devil's trying to get you out of position. And he's trying to get you back to where you were. So an offering protects us from that. And it says this, devil, Judas, you don't have my heart. I know there's a war for my heart today, but I'm giving an offering. I'm going to kid every time I get blessed, I'm going to put God first and I'm going to give my tithes. I'm going to give an offering. And this is just showing that God is first. So let's look at this. Let's look at it. And this is what he said. That perfume was worth a year's wages. Imagine Judas is saying all this. He's talking to the disciples. This is the conversation. This is how they got indignant and they got upset and they thought it was a waste. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. So we know where it started. The disciples were actually repeating everything that Judas said. This is what you got to be thinking about. Am I repeating what Jesus said or am I repeating what Judas said? 
Do I have Jesus? Come on. Do I have this woman's worship and gratitude and thanksgiving? Or do I sound more like Judas? And this is what the good news about this sermon is that you can break the spirit of Judas today and say, spirit of Judas, spirit of the devil, you're no longer going to stop me from getting my total breakthrough, my total freedom. I'm giving my whole heart to God. Look, now, now there's the truth. They were talking about the poor, but look what it says. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. He didn't care about the poor. He was, he was a thief. So he had a heart of a thief. And you might be thinking, I'll never do that. But the, you don't understand that when we bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord, we're given what belongs to him. And then when we don't bring our tithes to the Lord, we're actually just like Judas. We're thieves. Because the tithe belongs to the Lord. Right? I don't, well, uh, no, I don't believe it. Okay, but well, that's okay. Look what it says. He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, check this out. So the thief was in charge of the, the money of the disciples. Jesus entrusted the thief to be the treasurer. You and I would fire that bum. But Jesus was giving him mercy. And he said, Judas, I'm going to give you one more shot. I'm going to show you someone. Maybe you've never seen somebody like her. But if there was anybody sold out on the earth that wouldn't withhold anything, I'm going to show you how to worship me. Judas, let me give you an offering of a heart. And let me show you what true devotion and gratitude looks like. But instead of learning the lesson... He got deeper into his anger and resentment and love of money. And, and he was in charge of the disciples' money. He often stole some of it for himself. Crazy! Literally stealing the offerings of Jesus and the disciples. So instead of repenting, you know what he did? He got so upset that it triggered 100% betrayal. And after this offering, instead of being transformed, he went deeper into serving the devil. He goes, I'm done. I'm angry. I'm so angry because I could, that money should have been in this bag. So I could have stolen it. Because I mean, I just saw, that was a year of what the rage is. That would have been our biggest offering. And I could have just started dabbling in that thing. There were some things I had, I, I already earmarked that money for something I want. I'm so upset. Somebody better do something about this. I'm, well, if you guys going to do nothing, I am. Because I want my money. So he sells Jesus out for the price of a common save. 30 pieces of silver. He got his money, but he lost his soul. He got his money, but he also received the spirit of suicide. He got his money, and now he has a legacy for eternity that he was the one that betrayed Jesus. And it was all because of love of money. That, to me, it's just crazy. And you might be thinking, because I like putting myself in the story. And when you see Judas, he's a villain, man. He's a villain, and you think, man, I hate Judas. Like, if, you, if this was like a movie and you're seeing it like, ah, if I could just get a hold of Judas and Judas, ah. Some of you guys that got a little gangster in you, you said, like, we, we put a hit on them. You don't do that to my Jesus. Let me teach you a lesson, eh? You're not going to get away with that. Jesus might be, have a lot of mercy, but I'm still a work in progress, homie. So let me strain you out. You, let me break your legs. You don't do that to Jesus. That's us. <laughs> or some of you, right? He's the villain. But Jesus says, nah, let me handle that. I'm after his heart. And there's only a certain amount of opportunities you have. And as we're given, I, I, Jesus told him, I'm going to be soon gone. And Jesus is not saying I'm going to be soon gone to us. This is what he's saying to us. I'm soon coming back. 
So make sure that when I do come back, you got something to show for it. I didn't just save you so you could just build your own plush life. I saved you so you could build my kingdom here on earth, that my will will be done, and that you would be used to finance my ministry to reach the lost in this world. And no one is given to souls but believers. There's a lot of giving to Santa Claus this week or next week and the week after, but there's not a lot of giving to Jesus. But we're not going to be that church. We're getting ready for the biggest move of God we've ever seen. This lady did not know that her offering that week was going to prepare Jesus for the most important week in the history of the world. That she would prepare Jesus for suffering and death. And everywhere Jesus went, there was a perfume that they could smell. And it was the anointing that she put on him. Even when he was in the grave, they said this, we've never seen a dead person smell so good. What is going on with this? And what she was doing was honoring Jesus that week and she didn't realize that it would be one of the most important offerings that were ever given on earth. Now this could be the most important. I said, man, I wouldn't be like Jesus. I'd be like her. That's why I, I, I want to be like her to give my best to the Lord because I'm so grateful for what he's done and what he's going to continue to do in my life. And when I get to heaven, there's one thing you won't be able to do. You won't be able to give any more offerings there. You won't be able to preach the gospel there. You won't be able to win a soul there. You won't be able to feed a hungry person there. You won't be able to clothe the naked there. You won't be, you won't be able to have a men's home, women's home, women's and children's home, and reach the orphans in Uganda. You won't be able to reach none of that. The opportunity to do that is right now. Just like the opportunity to forgive the offering was just six days, and that can never happen again. Let's not miss this Christmas season. And let's make sure we put God first in our worship, in our giving. So this is what we're going to do. Take it serious. And remember this, as we're giving, this is an act of giving our hearts. So we give our best to the Lord. That's all. Everybody's best is different. But God sees as we're responding. He's aware. He's aware of the struggle. He's aware of the spiritual warfare. He's aware of even the spirit of Judas that's having conversations with you. And maybe even previous conversations before you even entered this room. They're skewing your thinking and your attitude towards an opportunity to worship and, and prepare Jesus to go into people's lives, reach them, set them free, deliver them. This offering is going to cast out demons. This offering... It's going to protect your name. This offering is going to reach your kids. This offering, come on, is going to reach thousands and maybe even millions of people this year, this offering. And when, when we give it, every soul that's reached as a church goes on your record. And you're not going to be one of those people that go to heaven and you just show up all by yourself with no treasure, with no souls. You're going to show up in the heaven and there's going to be people meeting you there and say, hey, I don't know, I know you don't know me. But remember that, that Christmas offering in 2023? You didn't know. But as you gave that offering, it reached me, me and my family. Look at the people that you're reaching that offering. And there's going to be people lined up just saying, thank you. You are credited for my breakthrough, for my salvation, for my healing, for my, for my eternal life. Thank you so much. That's what we want. And this is what we're going to do now. On the inside, it says, it says, my Christmas prayer request. I don't want you to miss that either. If you, when you turn in this envelope, if you want to see your son or daughter to get saved or you need a major breakthrough in your life, put it in there. And the reason I put it in there, why, why give a seed if you don't even are expecting a harvest? Like, expect something. You're exercising your faith. I want to thank you guys because... We do this three times a year, but I'll tell you this. We're reaching more people than we've ever reached, and it's all because of you. This is a partnership, and I want to thank you. I mean, it's one thing as a pastor to have vision, but the most frustrating thing in the world is have vision and have no support. Because God has set this up. My responsibility is to get vision from God and share it with all of us. And then I need to, I'm dependent on a miracle that God would touch your heart. 
and that you would say, God, okay, I'll do what you asked me to do so we could do what God has asked us to do as a church. But I want to thank you. We are, the, I, I, we are the, one of the most given people in, in the world. We are, we are a given church, and that's why we could continue saying yes to someone. Say, I want to get off the streets. Yes. I'm homeless for years. I want to, I, I, I need a place to live. Yes. I need food. Yes, we got food. We got a food warehouse. Yes. I'm hungry today. We got Friday, Friday we got food and we got hot meals prepared by chefs over there so you could have a hot meal. Yes. We got little boys and little girls that go to our downtown campus that don't have clothes and we go school shopping with them and we can say yes. Come on. We got single mamas that, that are saying, God, I, I, I'm, t- I'm overwhelmed by this and we send them big brothers and sisters to take care of them and help them and help them in their struggle and I want to say as you're saying yes we're going to continue saying yes thank you guys so much so we're going to let's all stand up and we're dismissing a second but we're starting off this Christmas season with a with an exclamation point and we're saying we are worshiping the Lord on this Christmas season before I buy gifts for everybody else I want to worship God with an offering it's going to change lives. Okay. So don't, don't everybody leave. I'm going to dismiss in just a second. This is a holy moment. Um, we're going to give our hearts. Now, what I, would like, what I would like you to do is get your offering. Even if you give online, you could take your envelope and put it up here as a sign that you're pouring your offering on the Lord. Now, if you want to give it online, you could do that too. If you want to just go all the way and drop off the envelope, you could do that too. See, there's two ways to get, get the envelope. Put the name on there. You might give online, but still put the name on there. Put it in there because we're going to pray for those requests that you put in here. Okay? And gather their requests and pray with you as a church, okay? We're going to intercede with you. We're going to agree with you and believe it from breakthrough, okay? People are going to get saved, set free, healed. Miracles are going to happen as we exercise our faith. And this is one of the most spiritual things you could ever do. One of the most holy things you could ever do. One of the most mature things you could ever do is give an offering to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't forget what you've done for me. I know who you are. Thank you. I was lost. I was an alcoholic. I was a liar. I was a cheat. I was angry. I was hurtful. I was hurt. I was neglected. I was abused. I, I was a leper. I was hopeless. And then you saved me. When no one else wanted to do nothing with me, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I praise you. Father, as we give this offering, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that we're being led by your spirit like she was, that she would give an offering at the perfect time. Maybe no one else in the whole world at that time had this heart. But God, if there's no one else, there's one heart here that loves you, appreciates you, and will not withhold my best from you. May we do this again in 2023 that there wouldn't be just one lady that would give an offering but there would be one church that would give an offering and that this offering will be a memorial that will never be forgotten that the harvest that we're going to see in 2024 has a lot to do with the seed that we're planting today we thank you Lord so we give this offering I ask you to bless every home bless every person that's given and multiply this seed and turn it in to a harvest that's beautiful. And you said as we're giving our offerings, you said it's beautiful to me. What you're doing to me is you've done a beautiful thing to me. That you take an offering personal. You see it. You honor it. You value it. It's prized to you. So we give it in honor and faith and worship and devotion to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give. Now, this is what I want you to do, the instructions. There's, there's like three or four boxes here. There's some boxes in the back as well. Just come in and drop it off. If you gave online, you said, man, I got to rush to get out. You can still give online. But if you want to go ahead and put the request in here, we'd love for you to do that. So let's give with a chirp part. So everybody should be coming. Hey, everyone. What an incredible service. God is so incredible. He's so good. We're, We're so blessed, blessed to be in part of such an incredible house where we get to celebrate the greatest gift which is Jesus. You know, the reason for the season really is Jesus. And uh, concerning Christmas, which is amazing, we have today is the amazing announcement and the great day where we are releasing our Christmas singles. Hallelujah. Yes. So today we release Silent Night. 
and have yourself a merry little Christmas. These are just songs that we want to bless you and your families with. Um, we're going to put up a QR code so that you guys can scan it. Original versions. Yes, original versions of these songs. You could scan this code, send it to your friends, your family. It's just a gift for you guys to listen to throughout this Christmas season. Mm -hmm. When you're having your cookies and milk, just know it sounds better and tastes better. Have yourself... <laughs> I'm married. You know what I mean? So when you're doing your meals, when you're doing all the things you're doing, make sure that you have this music bumping in the background. It's from your own church. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for calling this church your home. You're a member of a place that is doing things for God, for his glory. Look at all the things we got to give to this year. Look at what this church has already done. I pray that you feel a part of something bigger than yourself, feel a part of a purpose, and uh, we love to worship God. Talking about worship, last thing, we do have an album coming at the beginning of the year as well for a prayer album for your intimate sessions and times with God. Anything you want to say about that one? Um, one thing that I want to say about it is it's just um, a bunch of songs. They're all originals. Just songs we've prayed over and spent some time with the Lord. And, and I could tell you just by hearing a couple of them, I, I oh believe it's just going to bless your heart and your time with God and bring you in a deeper, intimate place with the Lord. Seriously anointed, guys. I've heard a couple of them myself, and I was just like, wow, we wrote this? That's so incredible. But um, you have an incredible rest of your day. Thank you so much for being a part of this church. We pray for you. Be strengthened. Be blessed. The best really is yet to come, and we'll see you through all the Christmas events. Hopefully, you can make it out here with your family. God bless.